Welcome to Straight Talk with Carlissa Thorne. Welcome to Community Voices with Carlissa Thorne. And today I have with me Darren Jacqueline. And I'm really excited today because we're going to be talking something about a passion of ours that we both are really passionate about. And we're going to be discussing how children can actually create money for themselves. And we're going to be also in empowering parents on how they can also teach their children and how to create money. So welcome, Darren. Great to be here, Carly. And I know this is a really deep passion of yours, and I'd love for you to actually share with people how you really got involved with this. So I'd love to ping it back to you because I know this is something that has been around for you for a long time, and I, I saw the graphic that I really loved, and so I'd love for you to actually share with everyone how you became involved with this. Sure, Carly. Well, I'm very grateful to be here today. You know, we're all kids, and sometimes we're adults, but there's kids inside of us. And when I was seven years old, I created my first little business called Rent a Kid in a little small town in Canada called Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Canada. And, you know, less than 20,000 people in population, a lot of farming community, rural areas. And I would go out and cut grass, you know, spring, summer, and fall. And I would shovel the sidewalks, shovel snow in the winter times, in the cold winters in Saskatchewan, Canada. And I deliver newspapers six days a week called the Regina Leader Post newspapers back in the day when uh, we did door-to-door -door mail of delivery of newspapers. By the time I was nine years of age, Carly, I'd actually had my two best friends in my neighborhood where I lived. We would go out and cut grass and shovel sidewalks to earn some extra money. What I learned was, years later, was there was a lot of life skills that I learned by being a young entrepreneur. And I learned to go out and solve problems in the community by cutting grass, shoveling sidewalks, raking leaves, doing things like that. And there's these life skills that I learned from, you know, knocking on doors, ringing people's doorbell, doorbells, you know, talking to people, closing the deal, you know, asking for referrals, asking for help, learning how to negotiate the rates, all these different things I was never taught in school growing up. You know, from kindergarten to grade 12, I was never taught, you know, any of that kind of stuff in business. And so, you know, years later, I'm in my 40s now, I look back and I thought one day, a few years ago, I was in the shower and I thought, you know, why don't I create an educational audio program called 101 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money where I can go and interview kids between the ages of 6 and 18 years of age from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life from across North America and across Europe. And these kids are actually out there. They're in action. They're actually after schools, in the evenings, on the weekends, during summer holidays, during time off away from school and from homework and from family. They're out there doing the little businesses. And what I learned was in my own self, was it helped me to work on my self-esteem, my self-confidence, my communication skills. Plus, my parents are very grateful because, you know what, I wasn't always begging them for money. I'd go out there and I'd work hard and work smart, and I'd go out and earn my own money. And so I'm grateful because those skills and those lessons I learned as a young child, I use today in the business world. You know, whether I'm out prospecting, I'm networking, I'm recruiting, I'm, I'm doing a proposal, I'm negotiating, I'm closing a deal, I'm asking for referrals. I do all those things that I used to do when I was a kid, whether you're a Girl Scout, or you know, you're know you running a paper route, there's all different things that we can learn as a kid. And I've always believed that kids should own two bikes, one to ride and one to rent. And so I wanted to help people and pay it forward and pass on because you know, I've done well in my life now and I want to pay it forward and help other people out. So what I would love to, my goal out of this is that I would love to teach parents on how to parent. In other words, I would like to impart tools and skills for the parents on how to teach children and how to have those skills. So that's my whole thing out of this. I would love for you to impart these skills and tools to parents because I think that's the biggest thing. You're right. In school, we, we do not learn these skills. We do not learn the tools. We're not given any of this. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to impart to parents. I think, again, parents, parents, right? And we learn through watching our parents. So what are some actual tips and tools you can give to parents and how to impart that spirit in our children? You know, well, first, for sure. First thing, Carly, is, is, you know, I remember as a child, and you probably remember as a child as well, we had a piggy bank. Now, I know in some countries, you know, I'm in Canada here right now doing this interview with you. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia right now. And, you know, a few years ago, the Canadian government actually got rid of the Canadian penny. I know there's conversation right now in the United States of America about getting rid of the penny. But some countries still around the world still have the penny in their currency of their country. And so I had a piggy bank growing up as a kid, and I was always taught by my parents, my grandparents, put, put the change in the piggy bank and let it grow. So key thing is with your children, go back to basics of get a piggy bank. Go to the dollar store, go to a Walmart, and get yourself a piggy bank where you can put spare change in there. Because piggy banks, over time, when you invest money in a piggy bank, 
becomes a biggie bank, right? So when you're early, you know, between age zero and the time you're born to the time of age five, six, seven, eight years of age, you got a little piggy bank. By the time you get into about 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, that piggy bank becomes a biggie bank. So key thing is that. The other thing is, is encourage your children to be creative and imaginative. Unfortunately, a lot of schools today around the world, and I travel you know, over 200 plus days a calendar year, so I see a lot of people in a year in live events and doing corporate consulting and stuff like that and corporate training and angel investing. One of the things I've learned is that when you're working with children, allow them to be creative and imaginative. Here's the thing to understand, Carly, is that we're taught in schools today, whether it's a public school, it's a private school, we're taught what we call linear thinking. And linear thinking says, you know, how do I save up money so I can eventually afford to go to college or go to university? You know, how do I save up money to go to college university? You see, when I guest speak and give back to high school students and college universities around the world, one of the questions I always ask the students and the teachers and the parents as well, I said, how many in this room with a show of hands plan to go to college or plan to go to university and come out with student loan debts? Raise your hands. You all have 70, 80 percent of a large auditorium of an audience. So there's a few hundred or a few thousand people in an auditorium say they raise their hands. And I ask the question, why do you want to come out of college or university with student loan debt? And the, and the room goes completely silent, Carly. And I'm like, I'm like somebody, somebody answer the question, defend it. And they're like, well, that's just what we were taught. You know, that's what our parents told us. That's what our school teachers told us. That's what our career counselors told us. I said, great. I said, how could you, would you be open to learning another way or another approach? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, let's look at non-linear thinking. Non-linear thinking. Non-linear thinking says, how do I get paid to go to school? See, I want you to teach your kids, if your parents right now watching this interview with me and Carly, how can you get your kids to get paid to go to school? Right? Because when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So the way we make more money is, see, here's the thing to understand is that, we're taught by our parents, we're taught by schools in the academic world that money is an object. And sure it is. You can go to your wallet or your purse right now and pull out dollar bills and say, yeah, Darren, money's an object. Look at this $10 bill. And I understand. I agree with that. But here's the thing I understand. Affluent people look at money as an idea. Money is all around us and it's an abundance. You know, we're, we're on a computer right now. We're using the internet. Well, that was what's created as an idea that somebody had their idea in their mind through imagination and creativity, they went out, they raised capital, they talked to people, they put together a business plan, and they went through all the steps to eventually get somebody to fund the deal. The thing is with your children is, how do they get paid to go to school? Well, how can you solve a problem? Even if you're in elementary school, what can your child do? You see the Girl Scouts all the time, and the Girl Guides travel around you know, once a year, and they go out door knocking. You see different nonprofit groups, different charity groups, different church groups go out and doing bottle drives on the evenings and weekends. You see kids putting up posters and going around and raking leaves and shoveling sidewalks and walking dogs. So the thing is, what you want to do is have your kids be creative and think, how can they solve a problem? You know, maybe kids need to own two bikes, one to ride and one to rent. Maybe you can go out and rake leaves, shovel sidewalks, cut grass. Maybe you can do a bake sale or a bottle drive. You can do a raffle. You can do a fundraiser. You can have a lemonade or a Kool-Aid stand. So the thing is to realize is that, I'll give you an example, I was just listening with a bunch of kids uh, and they're in elementary school and they were looking at different ways that they could actually you know, bring in different games and different toys into the school. When I was a young kid growing up, I used to like going to the candy store and I would go to the candy store and think, you know, how can I buy this, these candies? I used to call them blue whales. I used to pay five cents a piece for these blue whales and I would come back to the, you know, back to the school and I'd sell them. And I was very creative in that way. Now, I, I, you understand, I come from a family of government employees, government workers. I was not an entrepreneurial family. I was told, you know, go to school, get good grades, you know, get a, get a good degree, and then go off and then become a good paid employee. I never went that route. Um, so what I learned is I learned, you know, in my life, you know, how to solve problems, how to be creative, and how to be imaginative. And so the thing is, whether you're in elementary school, you're in junior high school, you're in high school, or your college university, we earn more money by solving more problems for people. When I was in junior high school, I was in grade seven, eight, and nine. I remember one time our junior high school made an announcement that they were going to cut the funding of some of our sports teams, and we would have no money for our uniforms, and the parents would have to pay out of pocket. So I thought, you know what, crisis or opportunity. So I thought, you know what, just a couple blocks down the street is there's this 7-Eleven convenience store. I thought. They're generating all the cash flow from all these students who got disposable income in junior high school, right? 
So I thought, why don't we just circumvent the 7-Eleven, and why don't we go ahead and create a school store, because we've got the real estate, we've got the property. And so what I did is I went and talked to the school principal, Mr. Wall, who was my principal at the time, and I said, Mr. Wall, I said, would you help me negotiate with you know the old Dutch potato chip company and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and these different vendors so that we could create a school store and the profits, the proceeds, will go back into the school. We'll hire the students you know, to volunteer so we've got the labor. And then I negotiated a contract with Pepsi-Cola to actually get a scoreboard for our school gymnasium that we got. It was a few thousand dollar scoreboard if we hit certain sales targets by selling so much Pepsi-Cola. You remember, this is back quite a few years ago. And things have changed now in terms of health and nutrition in the schools, but this is back in the 1980s. And so we negotiated that. Within our first year, we were cash flow positive, and we were actually earning enough money. Then I went to the home economic department in my junior high school, took some of the proceeds and the profits, and we bought some equipment at a bailiff sale. Some business went out of business, and they were doing an auction. We went and saw the bailiffs because they repossessed this, these, these, these uh, machinery. We actually bought some things like printing presses, and then we had the junior high school students, the girls and some of the guys in home economics class would actually print the t-shirts which was the school uniforms. And then we went to other schools that were in our school district and we started to retail sell through Fruit of the Loom, a manufacturer of shirts. We would actually do school uniforms and we did basketball, wrestling, soccer, football, all these different sports teams and then we sold retail and we had multiple streams or multiple sources of income. And within about 18 to 24 months after doing it, the initial startup, we were cash flow positive. Within two years, we were doing really good with our numbers, and we were actually self uh, self generating self revenue, and it was amazing. Then we would do school sport team events where we'd have tournaments at our school, and that was just a cash cow on the weekends. How much money we'd make, and we'd get sponsorship. We'd put sponsors around our school gymnasium, and we made money. We had multiple streams of income, and from that, so the key thing is, is how do you turn a crisis into an opportunity? How do you find the obstacle, and then you turn the obstacle into an opportunity? It's just a shift in your mindset from linear thinking to nonlinear thinking. And what you're saying there, I think, is really is is really actually positive because again, in school, we're taught rot thinking. It's like mm -hmm. memorization. Remember, you know, it's, it's again all that traditional thinking in school, and it's to not stop our children from again that imagination. So letting our children be creative, like they let you be. They let you actually out of the box. There is no box. Letting your children out of the box. Letting them out of the box thinking. I think that's so great that you actually were able to do that for your school. And I think the more we let our children be themselves, we tend to, it's, to keep our children in this rot thinking and making them be these robots that they're not. And the more we can let our children be themselves and accept that instead of trying to attempt them to be these robots that they're not, then we'll stimulate that type of thinking and that type of creativity that leads to something like that, which you did for your school. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to I went to public school from kindergarten to grade twelve, and I have a lot of friends of mine that went to private education or private school uh, throughout the country. And one of the things that you know, I've worked with a lot of people in you know forty one countries now. I've traveled to and I and I've built a network in over one hundred and twenty plus countries around the world. One thing I've learned is that you know, successful families or affluent families or rich families, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they they send their kids to private school, and, and the masses of the population say, "Oh yeah, why do you send your kid to private school? You know, to get a better grade point average or better academic marks." That's not why the majority of families send their kids to private school. The, the number one reason, the number one answer is for networking, because it's not what you know, it's who you know, it's who they know that knows you. See, back back in 1967, Stanley Milgram in the United States did a case study called the Law of Six Degrees of Separation. And Stanley Milgram discovered that during this case day that we were six degrees or six handshakes away from anybody on planet Earth. Now because of social media, media and the Internet today, we are now less than you know, one to two degrees of separation from anybody on planet Earth. So it's not what you know, it's who you know, but it's who they don't know is you. Here's the key thing. The world is changing. You know, www. used to be World Wide Web. Now it's www. which is worldwide wealth. You know, people have home-based businesses. Now we have what we call a phone-based business because you're in a mobile world today. You know, I, I, I've met kids six, seven, eight, nine years of age when I created this project who are earning money on a part-time basis evenings and weekends and during summer holidays. And some of these kids are earning a couple of dollars a month. Some of our kids are earning a couple hundred dollars a month. I met two kids in, in Utah that were Mormon kids that uh, were going around doing missionary work for their church. 
and people were coming up to him and saying, you know, can I ask you a personal question? I have to go to a wedding. I have to go on a date. I got to go in for a job interview. I got to go in and do a business proposal, and I don't know how to tie a tie. Do you have any tools and tips and techniques on how to tie a tie? Because I know you're really freshly dressed as a young teenager. These kids created a website called HowToTieAtie.com. Just go to YouTube. Just Google it and just just look at the stats. And they'll, some of you will fall off your chair. You'll be blown away by the stats that How to Tie a Tie on YouTube or on the Internet has actually got in terms of traction of results. These kids, when I interviewed and I met them, were earning more money in a month than some people in the United States or Canada make in a calendar year in terms of gross income. It was amazing, and they were on everything from their mobile phones while still going to high school. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's fascinating because here's the thing to understand, Carly, is success leaves clues. And, and the thing is that we look at Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg. Here's a guy in his early 20s who became a billionaire already. The world is changing, and, and I'm not motivated by money. What motivates me is quality of life and quality of time. Something I've learned is, and, and, and I teach a lot of kids this today, is that you, know, you want to go out and earn money. So what you can do is you can spend the money to delegate things that you don't want to do to create projects for people who will do those tasks that you're not good at but they're good at. So you mitigate your, 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 your time, but what you do is you leverage yourself so you've got more free time. You're seeing a young generation of young men and women today that are growing up in North America. What they're doing today is you know they've seen their parents stressed out trying to pay the bills. They've seen their parents strike with the unions. They've seen their parents you know, get upset with the governments and cut backs and setbacks in their jobs. But what kids today want more than anything is quality of life and quality of time. And that's why we have this entitlement generation of young men and young women today is because they've watched the parents. You know, there's a saying that says that I learned when I was a kid growing up was that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Monkey see and monkey do, right? So a lot of kids today have been in, in the environment where they've watched their parents be stressed out, trying to pay their bills, trying to get by, and they're like, I don't want to do that job that my mom does. I don't want to go to college, university, and come up with all that debt and take 10 years to pay it off. There's got to be a different strategy. There's got to be a different way. Today, we're drowning in knowledge in the Internet. There's so much free information. There's so much information out there. We're drowning in knowledge, but we're starving for wisdom. And the key thing is success leaves clues. So the key thing is who are you modeling? Who's mentoring you? What environments are you in, and where's the information coming from? And that's the key thing. Is so the thing is with your kids is that if you want to help build self-esteem, self-confidence, better communication skills in a rapidly changing environment, because we're in a global economy today, and the world's changing so fast, you've got to teach your kids to not only be good employees, but I believe also you've got to teach two two trains of thoughts. One is we should have school systems that teach kids how to become an employee which is the industrial age, you know, where you go to school, get good grades, go off and get a job with a big corporation in corporate America. And by the way, those aren't always the greatest ways to look at it today because of the change in the marketplace and outsourcing and downsizing and restructuring. Or you teach kids how to be creative and go out and solve problems and make the world a better place and be resourceful and creative. And through that, they develop interpersonal communication skills, self-esteem, self-confidence. And as they get into high school or college university or if they don't even go to college university, now they can choose what they want to do. Do I create my own business and eventually maybe hire some employees or some independent contractors or to go work for a company and then work their way up to that company. So there's different values, different choices that kids can work with. But we have to look at kids today because of the internet and because of modeling today, they're seeing parents that are saying, I don't want to do that. you know. And so we're seeing a lot of kids, they don't go to college, don't go to university because they don't want to come up with a lot of student loan debt. And then all of a sudden they got a resume with you know degrees and certificates but then sometimes they can't get into these jobs because they're overqualified or they don't have the experience. So there's a lot of different things we can talk about today, and I'm open to some more discussions on this kind because it's very time-sensitive information with this subject matter. Well, I think you brought up several things. I think going to college isn't necessarily the answer either because the reality is life is a huge lesson. I think a lot of people, you can learn more through experience being out in life, and half the time you go to college, like you said, coming out with debt, not necessarily isn't the answer either. I think if people know exactly what they want to do, they can go intern someplace. And again, you can also, like you said, create the experience by having an idea and going creating it. I think a lot of these kids are doing that, like you did. You, you know, know exactly what you want to do. You go create the experience, and you'll go create the business, and there you are. I don't. I mean, I, I, I did go to private schools, and I do agree with you in a lot of things that you did say because. Private schools or public schools or any schools you go to, you aren't necessarily literally learning the skills that you need for life, which creates a big problem. I think that is a problem, in my opinion, personally. I don't think the way education is today 
doesn't give us the tools we really need and the skills that we need in, in today's life. And I think so a lot of people actually are leaving the system and going creating life that they do want and then going creating the entrepreneurism to go create what they want. You know, Carly, when I was raised as a kid with my parents and my brother and my sister, my dad always said, my mom always said to me, you know, you better eat your dinner at the table because kids are starving in Africa and other countries around the world. Today the conversation is, you know, you better study and work on yourself because some kid in another country wants your job when you get older. And, and the other thing is people are going, are going to college, are coming out with debt, and they can't even get a job. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I think the thing is we need to go see what problems are. And like you said, coming out with a creative solution to go actually create the problem. I mean, in other words, taking the problem and creating the solution for the problem and then going making a business for it. Well, so, I think it, there's a lot of ways. Give an example of college university, for example. So you may have some kids or you might be a college university student right now watching this interview. And the thing is, is when you're going to school, here's the key thing. If you're taking notes, write this down. How do I get paid to go to school? And just start to contemplate that in terms of creativity and imagination is, how do I get paid to go to school? Now your brain's going to say, well, what do you mean, Darren? What are you talking about? How do I get paid to go to school? Where, where did that come from? Just start to percolate in your mind. How do I get paid to go to school? And as you start to think about it over the next couple hours, a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, different ideas are going to start to plant in your mind because we're starting to plant seeds, right? We're starting to develop that mindset training. One of the things to look at is that how do I get paid to go to college? How do I get paid to go to university? How do I get paid to go to high school? How do I get paid to travel the world and do what I love and love what I do? And so when you start asking yourself, how do I get paid to do that? It changes the mindset in your brain, right? So here's the thing to look at. How do I get paid to go to school? Well, what are some things right now that the kids that you go to school with, what are they buying? Mobile phones. Are they buying different covers of mobile phones? What applications are they buying? We're seeing kids today that are in high school that are actually creating apps for mobile phone devices and actually earning money. We're seeing kids today getting creative in terms of IT and solving problems with computer technology while they're still in school. You, look at how many businesses and look at how many successful entrepreneurs <laughs> have created successful business out of their college or university dormitories. Now, look at Dell Computers, Steve Jobs, look at these guys, like all these different people, what they've done, you know, Bill Gates, all these people have created incredible things. So the thing is, is that what we do is we just, number one, have an idea, and then we start to create that idea saying, how do I get paid to go to school? So look at when you go to school. If you're in college, university, you might say, okay, you know, uh, I, I speak more than one language. So maybe I could mentor or tutor or coach another student who's ESL, English as Second Language. Maybe I'm good at organizational skills and some of my students that are in my dormitory, they're very disorganized. Maybe I'm good at cooking and some of the students I'm going to school with, man, they miss mom's home cooking and I can bake some food for them and I can you know, cook. Maybe I'm good at personal fitness and I can you know, teach some other students I'm going to school with and they'll pay me for it to teach them how to do push-ups and sit-ups and burpees and jumping jacks and do you know various different option courses to actually improve my health business. I, I taught a guy recently who uh, in first year uh, university college, uh, he was very shy and more introverted, more methodical. And I said, listen, I'm going to mentor and coach you on how to meet women, college women, university women. And he's like, okay, I'm going to show you how to, because men and women are designed differently in certain ways. So I showed him how to build his confidence by approaching women in a non-threatening way and today he's successfully dating women. So he's come back to me now. He says, Darren, man, this really works. And women just dig me. They love me, man. Like I'm, I'm this rock star guy on campus. I said, great. Now how do you get paid to teach other men how to meet women in college university? Because men fear rejection. So this guy's now going to run small workshops, small seminars on campus in the lecture theaters. And he's going to do a 50-50 split with the college university or 70-30 split. You know, he's in final negotiations on it right now. And what he's going to do is they're going to revenue share. He's going to charge like 10 or 20 bucks a head, come in, do an hour, hour and a half lecture with a PowerPoint presentation, and then go out and actually practice it and teach men in a professional way how to meet women and then vice versa. How do women meet men or how to date men in college university? Maybe uh, you need to do fundraising. Maybe um, some of the students don't know how to supply, uh, you know, do research on school supplies or how to buy a car or how to get an apartment or how to take a vacation. So whatever you're good at, there's also people out there in the world that have the opposite. It's a weakness. So, for example, if you don't like housekeeping, guess what? There's somebody in close proximity to you that lives nearby you who just loves housekeeping. If you don't love doing your laundry, there's somebody out there who just loves doing laundry. So what you want to do is whatever you're good at, go out and do it. 
and you get paid to do it, and whatever you're not good at, well, you're earning money doing what you love to do, take the things you don't do and actually go out. You know, in the, in the United States, there's a great website called TaskRabbit.com. TaskRabbit.com. And it's a website where you can go to where you can take all the things that are on your to-do list that you don't like to do, and you can put them out there and people can financially bid on them, or you can set the price and people will actually do the work for you, and you can pay them cash or pay them through PayPal. There's criminal background checks done on them. There, there, there's due diligence done on them. And so you can take things and you can create more of a quality of life and do things you love to do because here's the thing to look at. We can always make more money, but we can't get more time. We've got some of the smartest people on planet Earth that are very smart people, and they've never figured out yet how we can you know, create longer longevity. Now, people are living a little bit longer today according to statistics, but we've never been able to, you know, everybody doesn't, you know, we, we, we all expire to some degree, right? So the thing is, is that we don't know when, our, you know, when we're going to expire to when we're going to die. So the thing is, is figuring out now as a kid or university or college student how you can do what you love to do. And, and you may have several different little businesses, little jobs as a kid, but it's the life skills you learn. It's, it's who you become as part of the journey which matters the most. Now, so this also is a podcast. I, I always like to put this in there because we, we get wrapped up on these interviews and then it just gets totally forgotten. Can you also tell people where they can find you, since this is also a podcast, where they can find you on the web? Sure. You want to write down my website, and through my website you can also connect with me via social media through Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and the other social media sites. My website is uh, it's triple W. It's Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N. So it's Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, and the last name is Jacqueline, J-A-C-K-L-I-N, dot com. So it's triple W, Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, J-A-C-K-L-I-N, dot com. Triple W, Darren Jacqueline, dot com. That's Darren Jacqueline, dot com. And all my contact information, information about me on social media is all right there at Darren Jacqueline, dot com. Now, I'd also like to ask, you know, we're talking all about kids. You know, why is it important that we're actually talking about this? You know, why should parents actually care that their kids get involved in business or learn these skills? Great question, Carly. Because the world is changing so fast today. You know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, the business model was, you know, go to school, get good grades, go out, find a great, secure job, and stay there for 10 to 20 to 30 years, get a watch and a pension, and have a nice retirement. Those days are done. That's the pipe dream today. Today, the thing is, if you don't work harder on yourself than you do on your job, somebody else is going to compete with you. And so the thing is today is teaching kids today about business, entrepreneurship, sets them up for a competitive advantage but also an unfair advantage as they start to age and get older in life because they're going to work for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the people who create a lot of jobs in the economy. It's not the governments. It's the entrepreneurs that go to people in the government to get the funding, get the contracts, raise the capital, you know, go through the permitting, all that stuff. But it's the men and women out there who are the entrepreneurs that think, you know, long hours and days and night, come up with different ideas on how to go out there and create, you know, businesses and business opportunities to employ people and, you know, save the planet or make the world a better place. So the thing is you want to understand is that today the world's changed. And we're in a we're in a global economy today. I always say the world's just a big playground and every country's in the room in the house, right? And, you know, I, I've been to 41 countries. I was recently in Africa, in Uganda, Africa, East Africa, and I was over there in the middle of nowhere, and I managed to find somebody. We got an Internet connection, and I was amazed going from Uganda, East Africa, to Canada in real time with virtually no delay in communication on Skype. So that we're in a global economy today. And, you know, with things like Kiva.org, which is a great organization, K-I-V-A dot O-R-G, based out of San Francisco, California, United States. You know, they're a great organization in terms of microfining, and micro lending. I learned about Kiva through Oprah Winfrey, you know, a few years ago. And I'm a big supporter of Kiva.org now, and it's a great organization. If you want to teach your kids about lending money, um, go to Kiva.org. For $25, you can lend 25 bucks out to somebody in over 200-plus countries around the world. They have a very success rate of over 90% of the loans get paid back. I've done probably, I don't know, 20, 30 loans so far, and not one has ever defaulted on me. And you take people out of poverty, you make a difference. So for $25, you can help make a difference. It's a great game. It's a great way you can play uh, to help people out. Just check out Kiva.org. It's a great way to teach your kids and to inspire and empower your kids about different places around the world. I think it's a great thing to teach people, and, and I mean kids specifically, because it teaches them also about giving back 
and they're also learning about money in the same time. I think that is a great organization. I love that organization. I also have another interesting question because people always talk about vision boards. What are your thoughts about vision boards, especially with kids? You know, I'm a big believer in vision boards. If you came to my place, I have a vision board. Uh, you know, I, I'll give an example, and, and I don't know how many of your listeners know this, but uh, back in the year 2007, I actually manifested a $6 million mansion off a vision board. I didn't own it. It was gifted to me to live in for up to a year uh, from an affluent family from Asia. But I actually looked at li lived in this 14,000 square foot mansion on 53 private acres just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And it's a great place. And the funny thing about this vision board is back in 2003, it was actually November the 11th of 2003. It was Remembrance Day in Canada. And I was actually in Vancouver. And I was actually living at the time in a place called Vernon, British Columbia, Canada, in the Okanagan Valley. It was about a five-hour drive from Vernon to Vancouver, and I was actually up there taking an educational training course for a couple of days. And as I was driving back, it was raining out that day. I remember it was like yesterday. And I drove by this large mansion, uh, and I was taking a shortcut to get back onto the freeway to go back home. And I thought, wow, look at the size of this house. Like, how do people live like that? Like, what do they do? I was just fascinated by this back in 2003. So I went a couple kilometers or miles down the road and went to a gas station, the Chevron gas station, Went in back in 2003 and bought a disposable camera. You know, we have a lot better technology today with cameras dated back in 2003. And I bought this disposable Kodak camera, went down, took a picture of this 14,000 square foot mansion, came back, put it on my vision board, and in October of 2007 manifested the same house. And I got featured on different media around the world and, and got on the speaking circuit a little bit more in terms of doing some stuff. But I actually, I'm a big believer in vision boards. But here's the thing. If you look at... Uh, if you look at, for example, construction sites, commercial complexes, shopping centers that are being built in your neighborhood or your community or major cities and centers around the world, they always have these big, these big signs. It's future home of Park Plaza, future home of Trump Towers or Trump Place. Why? It's a vision board, right? You see commercial real estate projects always having these condominium complexes in different places. It's a vision board. So the thing is, you've got to know where you're going. For example, I've done a couple trips now to Africa doing humanitarian philanthropy. Took a lot of pictures. I also had a photographer with me as well. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually ordering off of Amazon. I've ordered these um, little picture frames that are digital, and we're actually I'm getting somebody to upload all the pictures in there. So throughout my home, they're constantly just rotating all the different pictures. So it's dream building for me, and that's what I call vision boarding. It's called dream building. So whether it's health, it's finances, it's relationships, it's career, it's business, it's travel, it's it's acts of service, whatever it is for you. You got to know where you're going. You know, most people don't plan to fail; they just fail to plan. I don't. I don't have it to show you right now, but I actually have a master plan for my life. It's over 900 pages. Been working on it for the last few years. 15 minutes a day. That's my daily discipline. And I actually created this document now, just by spending 15 minutes a day at compounds over a period of time. But I actually have a master plan for my life. Just like if you went to a contractor and build a, you know, a subdivision, right, in your neighborhood. You would talk to a country to build a master plan. I have a master plan for my life. Now, people say, why the heck would you have a master plan? Let me tell you something. I, I travel over 200 days a year around the world, and I get told all the time, oh, Darren, you're just so lucky. And I'm like, you know what? I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. You know why? Preparation, meeting opportunity is luck. Preparation, meeting opportunity is luck. When you're prepared, you attract opportunity. I create something called a must-meet list. And, I, and I, I'm not able to show it to you here on video right now, but I, uh, I, have, a, I have a big wall-sized poster, like a world map you put on the wall of, of a house or of a school, you know, a school classroom. I have this big poster that of a top 100 people that I want to meet. And let me give you the numbers. So when I started this 15 years ago, in the first year I did this, I wrote down 15 people's names. I just had their names. I didn't have their photos because this is kind of before we were using Google and, and Internet today. And in that one year, out of the 15 people, I met 13 out of the 15 people. Pretty good for numbers, huh? One guy in Los Angeles who I met through a referral introduced me to 11 of the 13 people that I met. I only met two people on my own. 11 of them were done by introduction through referral. Okay? Last year, last year, I had 100 people on my must-meet list because 15 years ago I started with 15. You might start with five. You might start with 10. But now I have 100 people. I have their photos and their names, and they're all over the world. Time Magazine every year comes out with a list of the most influential people on the planet. There's Nobel Peace Prize winners. 
best-selling authors, celebrities, movie stars, sports athletes, CEOs, humanitarians, philanthropists, scientists, environmentalists. I can go on and on and on of different people you can meet. And what I did is last year, here's the numbers. At 100 people on my must-meet list, I met 84 out of the 100 people. They didn't all come through me. Some came through social media. Some of us at conferences and conventions, airport lounges, flying on airplanes, flying first class, different places, dinner parties, charity events, fundraisers, concerts, sporting events. But I also know, like, man, these people would appear. Now, why is it important to create a must meet list and add that to your vision board for Dream Building? Here's the thing it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's who they know that knows you. Children go to private school for networking to expand their Rolodexes because when they get out of school, if they go to school with such kids and their dad is a, a lawyer, an accountant, a dentist, a doctor, or a CEO of a company, it's a lot easier to get in the front of the line of getting a job or a contract or getting the door open if you know that person and they can make a warm introduction. With your must-meet list, here's the thing. What I've learned from experiences is, is it's not what you know, it's who you know, it's who they don't know you, but also never assume that you're not being observed. I've had people on my must-meet list that are on my list over the years that they're actually observing and watching me. Now, you'd be surprised to understand this. Carly, the most, the most successful people in the world, the more successful somebody is, the more accessible somebody is. I'll say that again. The more successful somebody is, the more accessible somebody is. Why? Because they delegate responsibility but maintain control. They're always delegating to teams of different people around them, so it frees them up to be able to think, to spend quality time with their, the, what matters most to them in their lives. So the more successful somebody is, the more accessible somebody is. And I, I've been around some of the most successful people on planet Earth that are alive today. And I've, I've traveled in those circles, and I've traveled in a lot of different circles, but I've been around those people on a frequent basis. And I, and I, I tell you, I'm not going to name drop here, but you'd be amazed at some people you see in national TV and movies and stuff like that. You see these people, and you see the handlers and the entourages and the bodyguards. But once all the cameras shut off, they're just like you and I, just regular people putting their pants on the same way you and I do. And so the thing is, with vision boards is, have a vision board party. You know, have a potluck party at your home or somebody else's home. Get a bunch of people through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, meetup.com, and come together and collaborate, mastermind, think tank with each other, strategize, mind share with each other through that collective intelligence to create your vision boards. You would be amazed at what you can accomplish once you have a plan, you have a vision of where you want to go and what you want to do. It's amazing. I'm a big believer of vision boards, master planning, and creating your must-meet list. Now, who should be on your must-meet list? Pick people that you want to meet. Why? Because think about this. you got children right now. Is it important who your kids hang out with after school, in the evenings, on the weekends, during summer holidays? Absolutely. Why? Because proximity is power, right? Who's influencing your children? So here's the thing to look at. With your must-meet list, these men and women, globally, locally, nationally, statewide, province-wide, internationally, guess what? They can become what we call your centers of influence. So the key thing is, as the world's changing, and as we're progressing forward, centers of influence. Take your kids on a holiday. Have them do charity work, volunteer work. Get them involved with different service clubs and organizations through your church or through different nonprofit groups. You'd be amazed that the more your kids meet other people around the world, the more doors open up. Because the thing is, your Rolodex. See, networking is a contact sport. And the thing is, is your Rolodex is very important because... Here's the thing to understand. Successful people, top achieving men and women, they travel around the world to meet other people because they know that their Rolodex is very valuable as an asset. See, a lot of people think, well, it's not important to build a network. I'll go out and get educational degrees. Well, it's not. The thing today is we live in a world today It's about results, specific and measurable results. So the thing is, is you want to be able to, if you're in a situation, you want to say, who's in my mobile phone right now that I can call? and collaborate with him or her and help me solve this problem or challenge or help me move forward to the finish line of what i got to get done. And it's amazing. And so vision boards, dream building, must meet lists, I could do a whole train on that and show you the things. I've manifested a $6 million mansion. You know, I get thousands of dollars a year in business clothing when I travel through a corporate sponsor called Dirks uh, Menswear. Uh, I've received trips, vacations. Uh, I'm going to a private island very soon that was on my vision board, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the Bahamas, you know, so I can, I can share with you all kinds of things. Only from, so when people say to me, oh, that's all a bunch of kumbaya stuff, I say, you know what? I got results, and I can back it up with results of what it is. So I'm a big believer in vision boards. The other thing I'd like to touch upon is mentoring. I think it's really important. Adults get mentors. We look upon people that we learn from. 
I think I think we need to understand that everyone needs mentors, and I think it is really important for children to have mentors. What are your thoughts on mentors for children? Well, I believe that when the student is ready, the teachers appear. That's what I was taught years ago by my mentors growing up. And the key thing is, it takes a whole community to raise a child today. And because parents are so busy at work, trying to pay the bills, fight the traffic home. So kids today need mentors. They need centers of influence around them. And that's why I think it's very important that you know you get your kids involved in different hobbies, different sports, different things where they can use their creativity, their imagination. They get physical exercise, proper nutrition. Right, so they're exposed to these different environments. But you know, one of the things that I, I'm a big believer in is that, you know, I'm a visual learner, and a lot of kids are visual because we see so much visual today. You know, take your kids on a field trip. You know, load them up in your vehicle and take them to the side of town where poor people live. You know, like a skid row, and show them there. You know, age seven, eight, nine, ten years old, show them and just say, look, would you like to live here? And the kids like, no, mom, dad, no, I don't want to live here. Okay, great. And then drive to an affluent neighborhood where people, you know, have their lawns taken care of and all that kind of stuff and say, listen, would you like to live here? Say, great. And then take a dollar bill out of your pocket or take some change out of your pocket and say, listen, if you want to live over here, you spend all your money and you'll live here like broke people do. If you pay yourself 10% and invest it and save it, called paying yourself first, in a few years or 10 or 20 years, you can live over here in this neighborhood. The difference is... The people who don't pay themselves live over here, and the people who pay themselves live over here. So you choose in your future where you want to live. All successful people who achieve high level of success always pay themselves first because it's a proven strategy for wealth building. And people who don't end up becoming a vicious cycle where it's, you know, just over broke, J-O-B, every month. And so that's the difference. So kids, you take them on a field trip, show them. Show them somebody who's successful in the community. Have them spend some time with that person. Where do you meet successful people? Charity events, fundraising events, uh, school functions. Anywhere there's involved in giving back, paying it forward, passing on, making a difference, you'll always attract successful people. Find out you know, people in your community that have built successful businesses. Whether you live in a small town, you live in a village, you live in a corporate, you know, big city, just find people. Google search them. Call your chamber of commerce. Talk to people in Rotary International, women in business, Toastmaster International. Find out different people and take them. Uh, you know, I've... My nephew, for example, and my niece and nephews, I have no children of my own, but I have nieces and nephews, and I introduce them to influential people all the time. And sometimes my niece and nephews are a little bit uncomfortable, like, Uncle Darren, you know, why are you doing this? And at the moment, they don't understand, because they're fairly young. But you know what? Give it 10 years from now, and they'll say, you know what? I remember when I was like 11 or 9 years old, my Uncle Darren took me to meet this guy or took me to meet this woman, and this is what this person did. Because, because kids are sponges, and they're always learning, they're always absorbing. Right? And when the student is ready, the teachers appear. So I'm a big believer in getting kids around, mentors and coaches, people of influence. Now, here's another thing as well. You've got to be cautious when it comes to finances. Because I'm, I'm guilty of this. I've, I've got around the wrong people with finances in my past. I'm on the right track now. I've done very well in my life. But the thing is, is we're, some of these people that, that teach us, you know, a great book to get your kids started is Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. You know, it's a game-changing book. Another great book by Robert Kiyosaki is called The Unfair Advantage. Those are two must, you must, what I create call, it is called a must-read list. Every year, what's on your must-read list for this calendar year? Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Just Google it, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Another great book to read is called The Richest Man in Babylon, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N, The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Just Google these, go to Amazon, go to Barnes & Noble, go on the Internet, you can find these books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Richest Man in Babylon, you know, Think and Grow Rich, another book that came out in 1937 by Napoleon Hill. These are classic books, right? The Science of Getting Rich by Wall Street Waddles, another great classic book that's over 100 years old now, but those principles are still strong today. So that's the key thing is you can get mentorship from, you know, meeting people. You can get mentorship from a public library or from a bookstore. You can also get mentorship from TED.com or TED Talks. If you go to www.ted.com, also take your kids if you can, take them on a field trip. You know, go to a park, go to charity events, go volunteer, go to a children's hospital. If you can take your kids out of province or out of state or out of country, do some missionary work with your with your church or through a charity. You'd be amazed at when kids go to another part of the world or another part of the country, and they meet people in different places in a different economic setting or a different environment how it changes their perspective on the world. It's amazing. 
So you've, you've actually listed some really valuable tools. I want the listeners to also know everything that he's listing, I will, I put together a huge blog post. So it'll have all the books that he's saying, it'll have the links to the books, we'll also put in some of his pictures he's talking about, we'll probably put a bit, picture of his vision board, and some of the things he's mentioning. So we'll have a really great together, everything we'll have on a blog post. So it'll have a really rich content, but everything you need will be on there. Great. So, well, okay. I'll actually email you. Uh, I'll email you my uh, must meet list if you want to post it. And you can that people can see it visually and they can see what I've done in terms of my hundred people on my must meet list. It's just a, as an example, as a visual demonstration. Yeah, I think it'll be great. We'll put together some really great content on there, so it'll be a great blog post. We'll put all some really good tools in there. It's really great images and all that. It'll be a lot of fun. So, what are some of the? What are some great, valuable, last minute like things you'd like to really get out there to the audience? Key thing is, is when it comes to your kids, is understand this is that it's not just about the money. Money buys you more time, which creates more of a quality life. What it is, it's the life skills that you're never taught in school. So teaching your kids, you know, how to have a lemonade stand, be part of Girl Scouts or the church group that goes out and does a bottle drive. Teaching your kids how to own two bikes, one to ride and one to rent. Just these little things that they do, these projects or these activities that these kids are doing, or these adventures are going on. It's about teaching kids life skills today. You know. We're not taught those in schools today, and, and nor should the schools teach it because they don't have the time. There's, there's so much curriculum they've got to get through. But in regard, regards to this, is it, it's the parents, it's the community, it's people like myself, yourself, they're putting on these, these programs to help educate people. The big thing to understand this is the world is changing very fast. And there's people in life who make things happen, there's people in life who watch things happen, there's people who wonder what happened, there's people who have no clue what happened. You want to spend time with people who are making things happen watching TED.com, reading great books, going to workshops, going to seminars, you know, watching great videos on YouTube, you know, watching your show on a frequent basis, Carly, you know, things like this, feeding your mind constantly. What I do, and to leave everybody, your listeners with this, is that I have a daily discipline. When I put my hands up like this, is 10. Just remember 10. If you just commit to reading 10 pages a day of a good book, 10 pages a day of a good book that will elevate your life personally and professionally, that's 3,650 pages in a calendar year, which is equivalent to 12 to 15 books cover to cover in one year. So pick a subject, pick an industry that you want to learn, you want to master, you want to become an expert in. You know, give an example. Two years ago, I wanted to be on paid boards of directors and paid advisory boards for companies around the world. I knew nothing about it but just the title of an advisory board and boards of directors. So what I did is it took me seven months. And I went ahead and I wrote down out of my Rolodex and I, I started to interview people that were on nonprofit groups, service clubs, church groups, that were on just volunteer groups of advisory boards and boards of directors. And then what I did is I interviewed these people by telephone, by Skype, in person, some I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with, and I just took notes. I was doing my due diligence. I wanted to know benefits. I wanted to know the drawbacks. It took me two years. Today, two years later, I now sit on a few paid boards of directors of international companies, public companies. And I sit on a few paid advisory boards now where I paid cash plus stock options. Now why? Preparation, meeting, and opportunity creates luck. I prepared myself. I went out, I did my research, I talked to people, I interviewed people, I read books on it, I went to the public library, I went on the internet, I read things on, on, you know, on my Kindle. I prepared myself. Didn't happen overnight, didn't happen in 30 days, it took two years. But I was patient, I was self-disciplined, and I knew if I just trust the process and allow it to happen, and I over a period of time, things will come to fruition. So the key thing is, if you want to own the space in some subject, or you want to create a business, or you want to do something for your life or your future, study it, model it, find people who are already achieving what you want to achieve, and go up and interview them. So if you're a kid right now, or you're a young man or woman watching this, and you want to own a BMW sometime, well, let's say, for example, you're downtown in a shopping mall or downtown on a street or in a public parking lot, and you see some man or woman driving a BMW, it's going to be scary. You're going to be nervous. But walk up to that person and say, hi, I just really like your car. Would you mind me asking you a couple questions? How did you get this car? Like, did you ever have any fear or doubt or worry about ever buying this BMW? Like, you could ever afford it? And you would be amazed at the conversations you'll have. By the way, I've done this lots of times. You'd be amazed at the conversations you'll create. Some people are disinterested if they're busy. they got to get going. But I bet you if you take 10 people, you talk to the BMW, 7 or 8 out of 10 people will stop and have a brief conversation with you, and you never know where the doors can lead to open to opportunities and possibilities, because you never know who these people are. They're driving these fancy cars, using cars as an example, where it can lead to open up opportunities for you, because this person's like, hey, man, you want a car like this? 
why don't I mentor a coach here? Why don't I recruit you into my business? Or why don't you, I hire you for my sales force to work in my company? I, I own a real estate company. I own a mortgage broker company. Or, you know, I run a, a yard care company. Or whatever it is, you'd be amazed at and, and what can happen. And understand this. Kids today are smart. With the internet today and technology, they're smart. They figure things out. I've seen kids three, four years of age know how to work an iPad and work, how to get on the internet and figure things out very quickly. So kids are smart. Kids don't lack capacity. They only lack teachers. How many languages can a child learn? As many as you're willing to teach a child. So you know what? Have fun with this. And you know what? Make a difference in kids' lives and pay it forward and pass it on. You can do great things with people. I'd also like to touch upon your program you put together, the 11 City Educational Program, the 101 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money. Because I think that's something that can be really valuable for children. So where can people, I know you're, this isn't out to the public yet, so I'd actually like to talk a little bit about that. So um, what are you doing with that right now? And explain more about exactly what that is, what it includes, what would kids learn from that. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So what happened was going back to my childhood, you know, I started my first little company when I was seven years old called Rent-A-Kid in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Canada. And a few years ago, I had this idea, I was in the shower one day, I thought, why don't I go out and interview kids between the ages of 6 and 18 years of age who've got little businesses, you know, after school, in the evenings, during the weekends, during summer holidays. So with permission, I started with my inner circle, my own personal Rolodex of people that I knew, personally and professionally, and I just went to them with permission and I asked, would it be okay if I interview your son or daughter or your grandson or granddaughter about what they do with their little business? And sure enough, they said yes, and I just started interviewing all these different kids and then the ripple effect started to happen is, People started interested me to their, their friends and their friends and their friends. And this became a three-year, almost a, a two, two or three-year project it was where, you know, because kids have different schedules than adults when we commit to things, you know. I would arrange some interviews and the kids wouldn't show up and wouldn't see them for a couple weeks or a couple months. So you learn as you go, right? But what I did is I interviewed over 50 kids from around the world, ages 6 to 18 years of age, from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different age groups, all different economic levels. And I interviewed these kids. And just like you remember years ago when Bill Cosby or Art Linklater had the TV show called Kids Say the Darnest Things? Well, I interviewed kids called 101 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money, the life skills that kids are never taught in school. So I created an 11 educational audio program where you actually hear the audio interviews of me interviewing kids. So what I encourage you to do is buy the, buy the program, invest the program. It's $99. If you buy it online, it's $247. But if you contact me through DarrenJacklin.com, it's not on our website yet. But if you go to the contact page at DarrenJacklin.com and just say, I want the kids program, we'll reply by email and give you an order form. You can and, and order it for $99. We'll ship it out to you. But you're going to get an 11 educational audio program. What I encourage you to do is have a notebook handy. And because you're, as an adult, you'll start taking notes. These kids are very inspiring, very bright. I have CEOs in large corporations do brainstorming sessions listening to these audios. Okay, I'm not exaggerating. Do, do some due diligence on me. You'll see my background, who I work with, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. The thing is, is that they understand because we're all kids inside of us. And kids don't lack capacity. They only lack teachers. And kids are brilliant when it comes to imagination and creativity, right? And as adults, we get stuck in analysis paralysis. We're analyzing things or we're, you know, got fear, doubt, worry. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm smart enough, good enough, worthy enough, deserving enough. Kids don't have any of that. They just like, hey, they want a lemonade stand. They just, mom, dad, can I go out and do it? And they go do it. It's done very quickly. So I created this program, why? Number one is to make a difference. I want this to be a tool to empower kids. I've got parents now that we've tested this with where they're driving in their mommy van, which is a minivan, where people are driving to them from school or to them from the, the soccer game or football game or hockey game, and they just play the educational audio programs while they're, the kids are in the car, and kids hear other kids that are around the same age group because the kids are ages 6 to 18 years of age, and they hear other kids talking over the, you know, the, the, the sound in the vehicle, and they're like, Mom, Dad, who is that? Like, oh, these kids got a little business. They're critical ideas. And the kids listen through mentoring and modeling. And also, like, Mom, I want to do what that little girl's doing. I want to do what that little boy's doing. And then all of a sudden, it creates a different conversation, and you'd be amazed. And, I, and I'll just share with you, just before we close here, some of the kids I interviewed, <laughs> uh, they're not even out of high school yet. They're earning more money than their parents are. So if you teach your kids right, they might be able to afford to retire yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm just showing you that some of these kids are earning more money than their school teachers and their parents are. And they were six, seven, eight years of age, and they just created an idea. 
and today they're 11, 12, 13 years of age. You'll hear the interviews when you listen to the stories of these kids, and some of them will tell you the income, the money they're earning, because they're pretty proud of it, and it will be mind-blowing. We I interviewed one kid who actually uh, hit millionaire status by age 20. You'll hear him on the on the interview. When I interviewed him, he was making over $40,000 a month and still in high school, and he monetized social media, and brilliant, brilliant kid. So we can... The, the, the program, 100 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money, will show you how to earn you know, $5 a month or $300 a year to up to over uh, $40,000 a month and beyond that. So there's a whole range, depends on your level of thinking and where you want to go. But these kids are ages 6 to 18 years of age from all walks of life, and it's a mind-changing program. It's, um, it's a little MBA program on steroids for your kids or for yourself as adults. and uh, It's a $99 investment, but the return on investment will come back to you you know, 100 if not a 1,000 fold for the ideas that you'll learn from the program. So just go to DarrenJacklin.com, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-A-C-K-L-I-N.com. Just go to the contact page because we don't have a shopping cart set up on the website yet. Just go to DarrenJacklin.com to say, hey, I want to uh, learn more about this program. And we'll send you out the details in the order form. You can get it done and we'll ship it out to you. And uh, I'd love, if you wouldn't mind, if your kids create a business and start rocking it, just a testimony would be great so we can pay it for and help out more kids and make more of a difference in more people's lives. Well, it's been an absolute amazing journey having you on, Darren, and um, I just can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom on children. I really love giving back to people, and I absolutely love the topic of children because I think our children are our future in this world, and it's just been amazing. So thank you so much for being with us. As everybody knows, I put together a wonderful blog post with all of Darren's information. It'll have everything you could possibly imagine and more. And I wish everybody a wonderful evening. And I look forward to being with everyone next week. You've been with Carly Thorne, your host. You can always find me at carlylissathorne.com. And I thank you, Darren, once again. And please, once more, give everyone your information. Sure, Carly. And thank you for uh, putting on the show and making a difference in people's lives around the world. My kind of information, again, it's at triple W. It's darrenjacklin.com. That's triple W, D-A-R-R-E-N, J-A-C-K-L-I-N. That's triple W, Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, J-A-C-K-L-I-N.com. That's triple W, DarrenJacklin.com. You can connect with me via social media there. Or if you want to order the 101 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money program or anything else you want to contact me with, feel free to go to DarrenJacklin.com.